Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and uh, Molecular Medicine podcast. And we're doing a podcast this time from, uh, from Adelaide in South Australia. And for our overseas viewers, it's a lovely part of Australia, um, a great wine growing region. We won the world's best wine uh, last week, for a $40 bottle, bottle of wine. So very good value here. I recommend coming to South Australia. Now we're going to speak to uh, somebody from a, a different profession than what we normally spoke to, and um, I think one of the most important, if not the most important profession in the whole of, uh, whole of nuclear medicine these days, um, and um, it's, uh, it's Jessica Mercurio, yes. and um, uh, you're a, 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 a net, net nurse, right? Is that yes. right? Now, <clears throat> a lot of people, particularly overseas who aren't from Australia, may not know what a net nurse does. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about yourself, where you work, and what you do. Absolutely. So um, my role is the neuroendocrine tumour nurse coordinator. I work out of the nuclear medicine department here in Adelaide at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And I uh, help coordinate the treatment of patients who are undergoing uh, PRRT or peptide receptor radionuclide um, Yeah, in Adelaide. So our patients can come from all over the state of South Australia, which is quite wide, and they can also come from a, a bordering state in Northern Territory. So, and we also treat some patients who are in regional um, New South Wales from Broken Hill and things like right. that. Right. A lot of people might not know how big that area is. South Australia is a vast area. It, it, there's one, one, one farm in South Australia. Um, uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, Alice Downs, I think, and it's it's bigger than the whole of the United Kingdom, right? So um, so it's a vast area, and so people who think that uh, uh, theranostics for neuroendocrine tumours, which we've talked about many times, in fact, one of our earliest podcasts back in two thousand and six was with Dick Quickerboom in the in the oh, Netherlands, wow. yeah. who. Uh, who helped develop uh, uh, neuroendocrine therapy there, and it nearly died. I think it, it really fell away in Europe for quite a while, and and it wasn't until it was picked up in Australia that it's become um, uh, a more widespread treatment. And now it's available in in just about every state in Australia, really, isn't it? Um, but it's still not fully there. It's still not treating all the people that need to be treated. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to treat people for neuroendocrine tumours using theranostics, it's very successful. We know that uh, it's by far the most effective way to treat the tumours and you can, uh, the treatment can last many cycles even when the tumour comes back and still keep working. So it's very important, but it's complex. And this is where your job comes in. Tell us about all the different things that has to happen before someone even starts getting uh, a neuroendocrine tumour therapy, starting even with the correct diagnosis, perhaps, and, uh, and, 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 and what information you need to collect. So absolutely. So we know from the data that um, it can be a very long time and misdiagnosis with these sorts of tumours is quite common. It, they, the hormone symptoms that our patients get can often mimic uh, more common conditions. So with the, the carcinoid syndrome where people get flushing and diarrhea, it's often misdiagnosed for, for menopause or for irritable bowel syndromes. And we know that our patients go out and they will see multiple different doctors before they arrive at a correct diagnosis. This can take many years and often the, the patients are metastatic at diagnosis right. um, as a result of this. So there's a lot of distrust that can harbour in that um, period um, for the patients against the, the medical system. Perhaps it's justified. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, you know, once they do get a correct diagnosis, they may be quite stable on a first-line somatostatin analogue treatment for, for many years. Um, but if they do progress after that on their first-line treatment, then, then often it's a thought that maybe these patients would be suitable for lutate. So there's a lot of imaging, there's a lot of PET imaging that goes, obviously the gallium dotatate scan. We also usually recommend that there's an FDG scan that happens as well to try and further characterise the disease of these patients and to work out um, 
how aggressive it is and that there's discordant or if there's concordant lesions that we can target with our therapy. Right. So this is so important. It's no use giving a therapy if it's not going to work. Absolutely. Right? And, and if, if it doesn't take up the tracer, yes. um, even though the tumour's there, you can see it on the FDG, it's really not going to be, uh, it's not going to be an effective yeah, therapy. So, so, so not everyone can benefit from, from these types of therapies yet, although we have talked about ways of upregulating NET, uh, 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 NET's therapy by, by, by making these tumours um, uh, uh, now become more, uh, 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 more differentiated so that they'll actually, actually work. And I think that's a whole other story, right? Absolutely. Uh, and it may sort of, inter um, you know, work out the scheduling of treatment. So just because they're FDG avid, it may not preclude them, preclude them from lutate treatment. It may mean, mean that we give upfront chemotherapy for a few cycles and really attack that disease before we step in and we deal with the lutate avid disease, uh, the gatate avid disease as well. Right. So it really informs our uh, the patient's progress and what sort of treatment and the timing of those treatments in their pathway. And it also, you know, the treatment requires special radiation protection, education of patients about what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to go to the toilet, all those sorts of things really matter, right? Absolutely. So um, we bring our patients in. One of the prerequisites for our treatment is that they have to undergo um, some studies on their kidneys to make sure that they're functioning well before treatment. And they're in our department for about three to four hours. So we can sit down with our patients and really sort of educate them on, on the potential side effects, what it's going to look like. And there's a lot of apprehension out there for our patients before they come to us. They hear nuclear medicine, they hear intravenous radio th radiation therapy, and it's quite scary. They think they're going to glow in the dark. Some of them think they're going to have superhuman um, powers. <laughs> so there really is a lot of education that needs to happen in that right. period of time. But maybe it's not over, only the patients need the education. I, my impression is that radiologists who should know better, oncologists who should know better, um, um, uh, surgeons who should know better, um, really uh, have have the wrong end of the stick when it comes to theranostics. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's a real lack of knowledge about theranostics in general, but also um, about nets, about neuroendocrine tumours. Right. There's not a lot of general knowledge out there in the community and with some of our primary healthcare providers as right. well. And this is because it's a rare tumour, but it's not that rare. Um, what, it's about the seventh most common cancer? Absolutely. So they really should know. <laughs> It is. I think it's, it is becoming better. There's more awareness. Um, Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia have a wonderful um, program that's trying to educate our GPs and our nurses to try and get that uh, diagnosis right and that educate, the education out there. Because if you're not aware, if you don't suspect it, then you're not going to be able to diagnose it. So just putting it on, on clinicians' radar, I think, is a great first step. So is it expensive? Is it more difficult for patients from a financial point of view? To access lutate? Yes. Um, no, we, although it's not approved by the TGA, we have a, a funding pathway, so there's no out-of-pocket cost for our patients to come and receive lutate treatment with us. Yeah. That's amazing. So for your American listeners there, please take note. <laughs> it's not to say that there aren't costs involved, especially for our rural and remote patients right. who come down for treatment. There's obviously the travel costs, right. the payment of accommodation. There's, you know, even parking at the hospital for oh, long periods. At the <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know a hospital in the world that doesn't overcharge for parking. Absolutely. <laughs> so there are financial toxicities included, but uh, fortunately our lutates, um, you know, is provided at no cost to our patients. But then there's the ancillary things that patients from remote areas. Some of these come from really areas of the desert in Australia. Very Absolutely. Much. Um, and, and they barely got access to GP services in many of them. So they go to get blood tests. Hard to get that sometimes in some of those places. Hard to get GFRs done and other, other sorts of things they might be needing. Yeah, so it's not just travel for the lutate treatment itself. We have patients who live um, rurally and remotely that will travel hundreds of kilometres just so they can get a reliable biomarker done to see a GP who can manage their case on, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a lot of pre-workup, you know, the 
functional imaging and things that are not available close to home that they will have to travel to down to a major city or somewhere else, um, you know, before they even get to treatment on multiple occasions. So it can, when it adds up over time, it can be quite time consuming. There's time off work to think about. There's caring arrangements for, for families and children and loved ones that has to be considered. So it can really impact on the patient's life um, having to undergo this treatment. Right, so it's quite complex, the, uh, uh, the way it, which this works in terms of all the different things that have to come together. To make, and that's your job, to make that complexity happen, to coordinate and to educate and do that. And without you, we really wouldn't be able to do it. So I really do appreciate that role. Is there anything else you'd like to say about, about that role or about how people in other places that don't benefit from this kind of nursing um, and coordinating and, and educating and, and informing. I mean, I saw some of the talks you gave. You gave some very technical talks. Just people think that, um, uh, that, that the only people who are expert in this area are, are you know, pharmacists or, or doctors or physicians or even technologists. But, but it's clear that nurses are technically expert in this area as well, I have to say. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. But uh, yeah, and nurses are integral to the support of the patient and the, the coordination of a program such as this. And there really is, through Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia, there's a real push um, to expand the role of the nurses and, and have a net nurse based in each state. There is inequity across cancers about how much support they get for nursing um, coordinators depending on, on the cancer. And we're really pushing for more support and more funding to be able to do that in the same space with neuroendocrine. Right. And it makes a difference because many of these patients um, survive um, almost indefinitely, for decades sometimes, yeah. if, it, if this treatment's kept up and done the right way at the right time, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it, it produces a tangible benefit so people can just, just get on with their lives. Absolutely. And we really pride ourselves with the support um, and the coordination that we give, the treatment that we give to, to make better outcomes for our patients so that right. at the end of treatment we can support them, they can go back to their normal life and put this in the background and, and continue to be well and healthy and live a full life. That's yeah. our aim. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your time you've given to the Thanks, podcast. Thanks, Rob. Thanks right. for chatting with me. Good.